Welcome back to the Security Plus Exam Cram Series 2024 edition. And today we're kicking off Domain 5, which covers program management and oversight. And we're going to jump right into the deep end today with security governance in Section 5.1. We'll talk about guidelines, policies, standards, and procedures. I'll explain what they are, what their purpose is, and how they are related. We'll talk through external considerations for security governance, as well as the different governance structures. Then we're going to dig into roles and responsibilities for systems and data. And I can't stress enough, familiarity with data roles is very important for exam day. This is an introduction to the fundamentals of security governance, not an entry-level topic. Let's get started. Welcome to the Security Plus Exam Cram Series 2024 edition. And today we're launching Domain 5. And here in Section 5.1, focusing on security governance. Now, Domain 5 focuses on security program management and oversight. And through these installments, we'll go line by line through every item mentioned in the official exam syllabus. Our focus in 5.1 is effective security governance and we're asked to summarize the elements of effective security governance. And there is some terminology I'm going to establish for you here right out of the gate, from guidelines to policies to standards and procedures. You'll need to know what these four are, how they're related, and how they affect one another. We then have external considerations in our security governance, monitoring and revision essentially monitoring our program efficacy and then revising as necessary. And we'll look at types of governance structures. We're going to wrap with a look at roles and responsibilities for systems and data. It's really the data roles that we'll want to focus on here. And you will want to understand who is responsible for what and which role is ultimately accountable. So let me start with a baseline definition of those four important terms. We have the security policy, which sets the overall vision and goals for information security. Security standards translate the policy into specific technical requirements and best practices. Security procedures provide detailed instructions on how to implement the standards, and security guidelines offer additional recommendations and best practices that can be adopted to further enhance security. Now we're going to work through these four in the order they appear in the syllabus beginning with security guidelines. So the function of a security guideline is to offer recommendations and best practices for achieving security objectives that are not mandatory. They provide the could for additional security measures. What could we do to improve our security posture? And they tend to be the least specific, offering recommendations that can be adapted to specific situations. For example, Employees are encouraged to take advantage of security awareness training programs. A gentle nudging of sorts. Next, we have security policies, which provide the overall high-level direction and objectives for information security within an organization. It defines the why behind security measures. So when we get down the road and attempt to implement our security strategy, we'll derive what we do from the why we're going to do it, contained in our security policies. These are general statements and principles, often pretty broad in scope. For example, the organization is committed to protecting the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of its information assets. So in spite of the fact that that's high level, it is actionable. Policies are a major input to procedures. Policies are the why, the procedures are what. There are half a dozen policies called out in the syllabus. We'll step through those now. We have the acceptable use policy, which defines allowed and appropriate uses of the organization's IT resources. And we'll also generally detail prohibited activities that could compromise security. So things like downloading unauthorized software, using social media during work hours. And it's often a document that employees sign as part of their onboarding process. And we have the information security policy, which sets the overall direction for information security within the organization. This can provide some guidance to IT and security in designing and implementing systems and services, establishing the right amount of resilience and recoverability. 
Incident response, which sets the high-level direction for how the organization will identify, contain, eradicate, and recover from security incidents. And the software development lifecycle, which is high-level guidance that software development teams must follow in creating software. It acts as a roadmap, ensuring quality, security, and efficiency during development. And this may steer the organization's development team, the development group, in making decisions on what frameworks they'll follow, what project management strategies they'll follow. A startup would often go the agile route, which is going to be very nimble and iterative. Larger organizations might use scaled agile. Organizations working on mission-critical infrastructure, for example, high-sensitivity materials and projects may choose waterfall. Next, we'll talk about standards. Security standards define technical specifications, often mandatory, as well as best practices for implementing the security policy. It provides the what and when for achieving security goals. Certainly more detailed than policies from a technical perspective because it specifies technical requirements for systems, configurations, or processes. For example, PCI DSS, which applies to processors of credit card transactions, would be mandatory. It's typically enforced in contracts. For example, credit card data must be encrypted at rest, in transit, and in use using a compliant encryption algorithm. So there we see the word must, which tells us it's a requirement. It's mandatory. Now we'll touch on some standards called out in the syllabus. Guidance on password complexity and password management comes from a number of sources. Some vendor-specific but authoritative sources like NIST and the Center for Information Security maintain guidance on password complexity and management. Access control, which specifies who has access to specific systems, data, and resources based on the principle of least privilege. So, for example, ISO 27001 offers guidance on information system management that can help here. Standards around physical security can be numerous to protect physical access to systems and data. So this could include access badges, security cameras, fire suppression, HVAC, security guards. There are a number of authoritative entities that offer guidance on physical security. ANSI, ISO, and NIST you've perhaps heard of. NFPA, the National Fire Protection Association, perhaps you haven't heard of. And for example, we could look at FIPS 140-2 or 140-3, a mandatory standard for protection of sensitive data within federal systems, which at its highest level also includes requirements around physical security. Encryption standards, which specify the algorithms and key management practices for encrypting sensitive data at rest and in transit to ensure confidentiality. So you'll see guidance here not only on the algorithms for various scenarios, but also the minimum key lengths. And these evolve over time, and they will be impacted by quantum computing, which is actually why a few years ago NIST kicked off a competition to identify some quantum-resistant algorithms, and they've selected a few in the last handful of years to run through the certification process. Moving on to procedures. Security procedures provide step-by-step -step instructions on how to perform specific tasks related to security controls. It defines the how for implementing standards. Procedures are going to be highly detailed, outlining the exact actions to be taken in specific situations. A simple example. A procedure for incident response. Upon discovering a security incident, follow these steps. Isolate the affected system. Notify the security team. Document the incident. And no doubt the steps beneath each of these, the subtasks, would also be detailed in that procedure. So let's talk for a moment about how policies affect procedures, the relationship between the two. So I'm talking about procedures here. So procedures derive from policies. Procedures are directly derived from the specific requirements outlined in corporate policies. Procedures ensure consistency consistent implementation of policies across the organization. They provide clarity. They translate broad policy statements into clear, actionable steps for employees to follow, whether those are folks in IT and security or our end users. And they can facilitate training. Procedures serve as a reference point for training employees on how to comply with policies. If you're new to cybersecurity, let me give you an analogy. I'm a big fan of analogies to make sure we're all coming along together here. So the policy is the recipe. The recipe would state the inputs and the outputs. 
the ingredients. If I'm making a pie, it's going to have things in there like flour and oil and butter. For security, we're talking about the data and the resources, and we need a desired outcome, a secure environment, efficient operations. I want a nice, you know, beautifully browned pie if I'm baking, right? So same situation. And the procedures are the cooking instructions. So for a pie, I'm going to put it in the oven, pull it out after X number of minutes. I'm going to cook it at a specific temperature. So for example, it would detail the how-to. Mixing the ingredients, our data handling. Cooking temperature would equate to security protocols. Cooling time, our incident response protocol. There were some procedures called out in the syllabus. Let's walk through those briefly. We have change management procedures, which would detail the steps involved in proposing, reviewing, approving, implementing, and documenting the changes to IT systems and infrastructure to ensure security risks are assessed and mitigated along the way. Onboarding and offboarding procedures, which would outline processes for granting access to new employees and revoking access for terminated employees, ensuring appropriate access controls are maintained throughout the user lifecycle. Playbooks, which are detailed step-by-step -step instructions for responding to specific security events and ensuring a consistent and efficient response. So in the Security Operations Center, playbooks are automated as runbooks in SOAR. Security orchestration, automation, and response. Moving on to external considerations. So here we're talking about external influences to our policies and procedures. So regulatory, so compliance with data privacy regulations like GDPR, HIPAA, and PCI DSS might dictate specific security controls and reporting requirements. This will influence our policies, processes, and procedures. Legal obligations can factor as well concerning you know, data breaches, electronic discovery, and intellectual property. Laws surrounding all of these will influence our policies, processes, and procedures. Industry best practices and standards relevant to your sector may provide additional security guidance. This would be especially impactful in regulated industries and high-risk areas. Regulated industries like banking and healthcare, high-risk areas like healthcare and public utilities, nuclear facilities. And depending on where you're located, you may have other influences at the local, regional, national, or even global level. Laws and regulations can all impact security requirements, and our policies, processes, and procedures should address all of these. Moving on to monitoring and revision. It's important to remember that effective security governance is a continuous process, not a one-time task. It's continuous oversight. Monitoring can take multiple forms, including security audits, regular reviews of access logs, periodic vulnerability scans, and analysis of our incident response metrics. And this can highlight for us areas where the security measures are working and where improvement is needed. And then we have revision. This is the process of updating security governance documents and practices. And these changes are based on the insights gained from monitoring. So monitoring can trigger the need for revision. And also changes in corporate strategy may trigger the need for revision. Let's shift gears and talk about types of governance structures. So to restate our purpose here, security governance is a process for overseeing the cybersecurity teams who are responsible for mitigating business risks that are security related. So security governance leaders make decisions that allow risks to be prioritized. And amongst other things, this ensures security efforts are focused on business priorities rather than their own. And there are a number of different security structures that may be employed. These might include a board or a committee, even a government entity. And these governance structures can be centralized or decentralized. Now, the most effective structure depends on the organization's size, complexity, and their risk profile. So let's take a look at each of these. A board, typically a board of directors, holds the highest level of authority within an organization. Their decisions are binding on the entire organization. So that means company-wide. A committee, on the other hand, would be a subgroup within an organization, and committees typically focus on specific areas or tasks that are assigned to them, and they're often created by and reporting to the board of directors. Their authority is generally limited to the specific area they are assigned to oversee, and their focus may vary. 
Next, we have government entities. So there are a number of government entities. NIST is one that I bring up repeatedly, and these entities may issue security regulations, standards, and best practices that organizations must comply with. In some cases, they're only providing oversight to government entities. In other cases, providing oversight to regulated industries. So for example, FedRAMP only applies to government agencies, but U.S. government provides oversight to the banking and healthcare industries. The NIST Risk Management Framework applies to government agencies and is mandatory. The NIST Cybersecurity Framework is designed for commercial entities, non-government, and it's optional. So the government entity's purview really varies by scenario. Okay, and then we had centralized and decentralized. So in a centralized structure, security decisions and controls are managed by a central security team. It sets policies and standards for the entire organization. In a decentralized structure, we're delegating security decisions and controls to some extent to business units or departments or teams. A central security team typically still provides guidance and oversight in this model, but some of the day-to-day decision-making and management is delegated out to whatever unit we've selected. We're going to wrap up with a look at roles and responsibilities. And what we see in the syllabus really look like data roles. So I would know these two roles, the data owner, which holds legal rights and complete control over a single piece of data, usually a member of senior management. They can delegate some day-to-day duties. What they can't do is delegate total responsibility. They're still accountable. We have a data custodian, which is responsible for safe custody, transport, and storage of data, implementation of business rules, technical controls, you know, confidentiality, integrity, and availability, audit trails, etc. Usually someone in the IT department, they do not decide what controls are needed, but they do implement controls for the data owner. If the question mentions day-to-day management, that's typically a data custodian we're talking about. And if we look at GDPR, a regulation which applies to any organization with customers in the European Union, GDPR does their data roles a bit differently. So there are two roles that appear in GDPR that also show up here. There's the data processor, which is described as a natural or legal person, public authority, agency, or other body, which processes personal data solely on behalf of the data controller. And notice it says processes personal data. So we're talking about the data of individuals. GDPR is considered the gold standard of privacy regulations. Then we have the data controller, the person or entity that controls the processing of the data who is responsible for the data. So controller sounds a bit like data owner, processor sounds a bit like custodian. They're not exactly the same, but there are some similarities. And these are called out in the official study guide, so they may appear on the exam. There are a couple of other roles I want to make sure you're familiar with also. So two other roles, data subject, which refers to any individual person who can be identified directly or indirectly via an identifier. So it's the person who can be identified. The person is the subject. We talked about subject and object earlier in the series. The subject is the person. The object is the data or other resource. Identifiers might include an ID number, location data, or via factors specific to a person's physical, psychological, genetic, mental, economic, cultural, or social identity. Any direct or indirect identifier, essentially. Then we have the data steward, who ensures the data's context and meaning are understood and business rules governing the data's usage are known and followed. They use that knowledge to ensure the data they are responsible for is used as intended. So data owners often delegate some duties to this role. And that does it for section 5.1. I hope you're getting value from the series. As always, if you have a question, leave it in the comments below the video. Reach out directly on LinkedIn. Happy to help anywhere I can. I'll see you back here in the next day or so for section 5.2. And until next time, take care and stay safe.